good news for you today. Jesus Christ is real and alive. His life makes the blind to see and heals all manner of diseases. His life changes hearts and lives in an instant. His life opens the eyes of spiritually blind as well as physically blind. So I hope today as you watch this glory story that you'll open your heart to Jesus, let him flow into you and bring in his life-changing power and love. We're going to be talking about a woman named Gertrude Tyser, whom I knew personally has a phenomenal miracle that God did for her. She had multiple sclerosis. She had it for years and years and years. And many times she would get sick and they would have to send an ambulance and rush her to the hospital. And she would always tell you the ambulance driver, she'd say, don't forget my shoes, bring my shoes. Well, you know, they thought she was a little bit crazy because she couldn't walk. She was bedridden and and what's the point of bringing shoes? But she was, she was adamant about it. And then she'd get a little better at the hospital and they'd send her home again. And then in due time, she would have another episode where her MS got worse and they'd rush her to the hospital again. She'd say, don't forget my shoes, bring my shoes. Well, this happened over and over. So finally one, one time they took her to the hospital and of course she demanded that her shoes come with her as usual. And, and she had, when she was in the hospital, she had three heart attacks and a stroke, and they, they thought she was going to die at any time. They put her under an oxygen tent, which I don't know that they do that anymore, but that's what they did then. She lived in Las Vegas. And meanwhile, there was a woman named Beatrice that lived in Maryland, and God spoke to the woman and told her that he wanted her to come from Maryland to Las Vegas and to go to the incurable wards in Las Vegas and ask people, do you believe God can heal you? And the second question is, would you like prayer? You know, I think those are important questions. First question, remember, do you believe God can heal you? She was going to ask that to the people in the incurable wards in Las Vegas. I think that's a question that we need to ask ourselves. You need to ask yourself, do you believe God can heal you? If the answer is no, you need to read your Bible and see who Jesus is. And he's still alive. He's still the healer. He is the great physician, and he can heal you of whatever it is that you need healing of today. He, he specializes in whatever is impossible. So if it's impossible for you, listen to the story of Gertrude Tyser. Here she is under an oxygen tent, had three heart attacks, a stroke, MS. She was paralyzed. There she is. So... Beatrice comes from Maryland in obedience to the Lord, comes to Las Vegas. It's the middle of the summertime. She starts going to incurable wards and asking them these two questions. That's what God told her to do. Uh, uh, eventually, she comes to Gertrude Tyser's ward. So she said, do you believe in healing? Of course, Gertrude couldn't even respond. She, you know, yes. Do you want prayer? Yes. Okay. So at that point, Beatrice begins to go on a three-day fast because the way, the, this is what happened. When she said those things and she prayed for Gertrude and Gertrude left her room, the Lord speaks to Gertrude and tells Gertrude, I sent her to you. So she, she, call, she asked the nurse to please go get that lady back again. And so they went after Beatrice, brought her back again. And Gertrude says, God sent you to me. Well, that's the thing that triggered the whole thing because God told Beatrice that when somebody responded to her and said, God sent you to me, that's the woman that he wanted her to pray for. So she knew then that Gertrude Tyser was the woman God sent her to pray for, clear from Maryland, just for Gertrude Tyser. So she begins fasting and praying. It's the middle of the summer. She's having no water, no food, nothing. Total fast. The next day she comes back. Gertrude's gotten worse. She continues to pray, to fast, to believe God. She comes back the next day. Gertrude's even worse. She continues to pray and fast and believe God. The third day when she comes back, they have called the family and they told the family to make funeral arrangements that she's going to die any minute. So Beatrice walks into the room. She sees that Gertrude is really, she's going to die any minute. And she tells Gertrude something I think is important for us. She said, you know, Gertrude, the way that you got saved 
was by faith in God. And the moment you believed that he washed away your sins, the moment you believed that he was your Savior and your Lord, that's the moment that you got saved. It was by faith in the Word of God and in the faith in Jesus Christ. By faith you got saved as soon as you asked for it. She said healing is the same way. You receive it by faith, and it can happen in a moment's time, the same way that you're saved by faith in a moment's time. You can be healed by faith in a moment's time. And she said it's like this. She gave her an example. She said it's like if you're very, very thirsty, and there's a glass of water sitting on your nightstand, and you know that that water's there, and you know you can see it, and you know that if you drink that glass of water, it's going to quench your thirst. But if you don't pick up the glass of water and drink the glass of water, you know it's still there, but if you don't drink it, it's not going to help your thirst at all. He says, you need to pick up the glass of water of healing and drink it. Take it into yourself. Receive it into yourself, and God will heal you. I, I pause there for a minute because I think that lots of people out there that need to be healed, and maybe you've been praying and praying and praying and and maybe you haven't gotten any answer at all from God. You know, half of it is that you're asking him for a healing. But just as important as asking him, the other half is receiving it. You have to believe that you're going to receive it. If you don't believe you're going to receive it, you're never going to receive it. You can pray and pray and pray till you're dead in the grave, and you'll never receive anything from God unless you personally receive it unto yourself which is what she was trying to give the example of the glass of water to show Beatrice, that, I mean, to show Gertrude that she needed to drink it, she needed to receive it into herself, and that's the way healing was going to come about. Well, you know, what, life was ebbing out, out of Gertrude, and, and God had been dealing with her for months and months and months and, and telling her that, that she, needed to, <clears throat> she needed to go into the ministry. He wanted her to go into the ministry. And she was so resistant to that. She, she, she argues with the Lord, but Lord, you know, I, I, I don't really speak very well. He said, I know that. He says, but Lord, I don't know the Bible very well. He says, I know that. I can teach it to you. Don't worry about that. She says, but Lord, I'm a woman. He said, I noticed that. He said, it's okay. I'm calling you. And she resisted. She felt like she was a worm. She felt like she just couldn't do it. And, and so he, t he says to her, well, because she's dying right now. She's dying. I mean, like they're pulling the sheet over her head and proclaiming her dead. And he says, all you have to do is just tell how I healed you. She said, so then she thought, well, I, I can do that. So she said, okay, I can do that. I'll do that. So they pulled the sheet over her head. The head nurse came in and declared her officially dead, signed out the, all the, the papers that say someone is dead, and went back to her nurse's station. Well, <clears throat> there Gertrude is with the sheet over her face, dead. Jesus walks in the door. He puts his hand in the middle of Gertrude's body, and warmth starts spreading through her whole body. The life of Jesus Christ spreads through her whole body and makes her completely and totally well. She, she come, gets out of the bed she puts on the shoes, which she's been telling him to bring her for months and months. She puts on her shoes, and she begins walking down the hall toward the nurse's station. Well, a couple of the nurses see Gertrude, and they think she's a ghost because she's supposed to be dead, and they, they pass out. They pass out. Uh, and then the, here comes the head nurse, and she sees Gertrude walking, and she says, you can't be walking. You're dead. You know, you, you know go, go, go get back in the... You're dead. I just said you were dead. I signed your papers. You can't be walking. I mean, she, nobody could believe in the people that were in the hospital along with Gertrude. They see Gertrude walking down the hall, and they recognize this is a miracle of God. They knew this woman was terminal. She was dying. She was, well, they probably knew she was dead already. They said, this is, this is a miracle. So they began to believe God. The Lord instruct, instructed Gertrude Tyser to stay there for three days and nights in the hospital, even though she was well. They did every kind of test known to mankind on her, and they couldn't find anything wrong with her because there was nothing wrong with her. She was perfectly normal. And the other people wanted Gertrude to pray for them, the people in the hospital. So she would pray for other sick people, and God would heal them too. 
and even the bed that she was lying in, if anybody would touch the bed that Jesus came to, it would be like there was electricity in the bed. There was such a powerful, powerful anointing on Gertrude by the presence of Jesus. News, of course, of this spread like wildfire throughout uh, Las Vegas and, and people all over the city and beyond the city were getting uh, just amazed that God had raised this woman from the dead. So her testimony the rest of her life, even though she couldn't speak very well, even though she didn't know the Bible very well, even though she wasn't a woman, all the, whatever, whatever hindrances she felt like she had, Jesus is sufficient to take over all of those hindrances and overcome them and allow her to have a very productive life in the spirit because she went and she told her story everywhere. See, I'm still telling it to you now, all of these years after it's happened. So her story goes on and on. So she still if you will, from the grave, she's still evangelizing, telling people that Jesus is a healer today. Did you like that story? Well, I did. I hope you did. This is a woman that I personally knew. She came to our television station and, and gave her testimony over our television station. Well, you know, the last, uh, the last program that I made with you was about John G. Lake. And he, he had so many wonderful things in his life. And I only got about half the way through, so I think I'll just tell you some more about John G. Lake. I, I, I took the story through till the time that he arrived in Africa and how God had provided through so many miraculous interventions for him to have the funds to even get there. And once he got there with his seven children and his wife, there was a woman waiting on the dock when the boat arrived who came there by, by the Lord, sent her there to find a man that was a missionary from America who had seven children and he and his wife, which made nine people, and that, and that God told her to give them her house to live in. So they had a, ho a house provided for them when John G. Lake had no idea how he was going to provide for his family. He just simply trusted God. So now they were in Africa, and that's where God was sending them. Uh, he, he founded the Apostolic Church in, in Africa, which eventually grew to be a very huge work. It had like 125 uh, white churches and 500 native churches. So it was huge all over South Africa. And it, so during the time, he, he actually was pastor of that Apostolic Church in Johannesburg, South Africa. And while he was the pastor there, he, he saw so many wonderful things. Uh, once a lady came and she brought a letter with her. She said, this is a letter from my son, and my son is dying in America of tuberculosis. He's dying, and he's, he's asking for us to pray for him. And so John G. Lake takes it to the, to the podium, and he, he tells the people in the congregation, everybody begin praying for this young man in Iowa who's dying, and we'll all pray together. So John G. Lake get, gets down on his knees and he begins to pray for this boy, this young man. He prays and as he's praying, God takes him out of, out of his body, if you will, and, and takes him in the spirit like a thousand miles away. I was a, I was a thousand miles away from South Africa and God takes him to the very room. He sees this man sitting by the fireplace in his home in Iowa he has a young boy, his child in his lap, and he's sitting there in a, in a debilitated state on the verge of death, but sitting by the fireplace holding his son. So John G. Lakes, in, in, in this episode he's having with God, he puts his hands on the man's shoulders, his head, his shoulders area, and he prays for the man and asks God to heal this young man and give him a life so that he can raise his family so that his, his mother's heart in South Africa will be, will be a happy heart instead of a sad heart. And to ask, he, he asked Jesus to heal this man in the name of Jesus. And when he finished praying, he found himself immediately back on his knees on the platform in his church in South Africa. Well, about six months later, they got a letter from the man. You know, things moved slowly back then. He, they got a letter from the man, and he, and he said that he was well. He was a college professor. He's now back on the job again because he's totally healed, and the healing began the same day that John G. Lake, by vision, went to him and prayed for him. Amazing. 
that's a that's a true story. Whether you believe it or not, it's it is irrelevant. It is a true story, and it did happen. Another time, John G. Lake went out to visit one of his native pastors named Elias. So he went to this tent. Not it was a hut. Let's call it a hut. It wasn't really a tent. It was a hut, and and Elias's wife was there. But Elias wasn't there. So John G. Lake said, where is Elias? She said, oh, he's gone to a hut uh, over a little ways uh, to pray for a baby that's had an accident. So John G. Lake goes over to the hut where Elias is, and he sees Elias over in the corner of this hut, and he has a baby that he's praying for. And so John G. Lake goes over there to see the baby, and, and he asks, what's the matter with the baby? He said, Elias told him, that the mother had the baby wrapped in a blanket on her back, which is the way they carried babies then. The baby had fallen out of the blanket and had fallen and, and hurt himself. And, and John G. Lake takes the baby to examine what's wrong, and he sees right away he can tell the neck of the baby's broken. It's just like a, a rag doll. It, just, it could go any direction. It was a totally broken neck. Well, John G. Lake didn't have faith to believe that that baby's neck was going to be made right again. So he leaves Elias because he didn't want his unbelief to have any effect on this man. So he went to a different hut, and he, he continued to pray for the baby. John G. Lake did. He continued praying for the baby till about 1 o'clock in the morning. And then he laid down and went to sleep. About 3 o'clock, Elias comes into that hut, and John G. Lake says, well, how's the baby? He said, oh, Jesus healed the baby. Baby is fine. John G. Lake was astonished. So he went over to the hut where the baby was. He took the baby up, and sure enough, the baby's neck was normal. The baby was smiling and laughing. The baby was 100% well. Jesus Christ had healed the baby's broken neck because of an, a native African man who had faith enough in God to believe God for a broken neck to be healed. So John G. Lake went out of the hut that night, and he prayed, and he said, Oh, God. Please take away this cursed unbelief that's a hindrance to my faith. Take it away. And I think many of us need to say the, say the same thing to the Lord, to take away our lack of faith, our unbelief that hinders God from doing what God can do. Because God can do anything and everything if we will only believe. Elias, the native pastor, had the faith to believe God for anything. And that's why he got the results that he did. Another time there, there was a, a native pastor, his name was William Lyon. I think that name Lyon is a wonderful name for him because it, when, when John G. Lake first met him, he didn't even wear clothes. You know, natives, they didn't wear clothes back then. A lot of them didn't. And so that's, he, had, he was totally illiterate. He didn't know how to read or write at all. But he had the faith of Jesus Christ in his heart. And so they, they had brought a lot, over 100 sick people out into a valley one time. I don't know why they did it, but that's what they did. They, uh, over 100 sick people in this valley. And Edward Lyon climbed upon the mountain overlooking this valley. And with all of his heart, he prays to God for these people. He stretches out his hands and he cries out to God and asks God to heal these people in the valley that need him so bad. And he cried out with faith, believing that whatever he asked God for, he would do. And so when he cried out, God, the Spirit of God came and the healing virtue of God came. And all the people in that valley, over 100 people were healed of all of their myriad diseases all at the same time, simultaneously. How about that? You know, why, why should it surprise us when God does what he says he's going to do? Why should that be a surprise to us? You remember Jesus said, the things that I do shall ye do, or the works that I do shall ye do, and greater works than these because I go to the Father. So when we see things in, in this hour today that are greater than even things that we read about Jesus doing, Jesus said that he would do greater things. I say he would do them because he's still the one that does them by his spirit. So he'll, he'll, do, he'll do greater things through us and in our lifetime than what we even read about in the Bible because that's what he says that he will do. So, you know, this illiterate man who couldn't even read or write named Edward Lyon simply believed God. He believed that God could and would 
do anything and everything that he asked of him. And so God did. Another time in John G. Lake's church, uh, a person came and said, you know, my cousin has been in an insane asylum for seven years and is just mad, is completely, totally mad. And I'm, I'm going to ask you if you could please have the congregation pray for my cousin in the insane asylum. So John G. Lake had everybody on this occasion also begin to pray for this cousin in the insane asylum. And a similar thing happened to him this time. He, he was taken in the spirit to the place in, I think it was Ireland, where this woman was in the insane asylum, the cousin. And he, he, was, he entered into the insane asylum, and he saw the woman. She had straps on her ankles, straps across her knees, straps across her chest, and straps, her, her arms were strapped to a cot. She was strapped down to a cot, and she was just, just, she was out of her mind, just tossing her head and babbling, not making any sense about anything. She was insane. She'd been like that for seven years. So John G. Lake comes over to her bedside. He sees the state that she's in. He, you know, God's given us power over all the power of the enemy. That's what Jesus did. He gave us power over all the power of the enemy and says, nothing shall by any means harm you. He even said, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So he tells us these signs will follow those that believe. He even told his disciples in the 10th chapter of Matthew, he said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. He's saying, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you've received, freely give. These are the commands that he's given to us to do these things. So don't be surprised when somebody like John G. Lake and hopefully like you will raise up and, and do these things that God called us to do. This is what we're supposed to be doing. This is what we're called to be doing. That's what we're anointed to be doing. That's what our life should be all about. The kingdom of God is not just in word, it's in power. The kingdom of God is in power. These are the powerful things, tools that God's put in our hands. So if we're not using these tools today by faith in Jesus Christ and faith in his word, something's wrong with you if you're not using these tools today. And you need to, you need to believe God for what he says. He's not a man that he should lie. He tells you to cast out devils. You should cast out devils. So, okay, so here's John G. Lake. Here's this woman that's obviously possessed by devils. He takes authority over him. I bind you, I bind you, you, you demons, away from this woman. In the name of Jesus Christ, you have to leave. Now, see, whatever you say in Jesus' name, they have to do that. It's not because you're a hot shot. It has not, you know, nothing to do with you being a hot shot. It has to do with you being a human being that believes that the power of Jesus is going to get rid of the devils. So in the, you always do it in the name of Jesus. If you don't do it in the name of Jesus, the devils sit there and laugh at you. Who do you think you are? You can't make me leave. You remember I told you that happened to Smith Wigglesworth when he, when he was called to a demonic, demonic possessed woman. And the demons in the woman that spoke through the woman and they said, you can't make us leave. This was Smith Wigglesworth. You can't make us leave. And he says, I can't. See, he knew he couldn't. But he says, Jesus Christ is in me and Jesus can make you leave. So in the name of Jesus, you leave this woman now. That's what he did. And that's what the, when the devils left, when Smith Wigglesworth said that. And so when John G. Lake said that to this woman in the insane asylum. He said the same thing. I bind you away from this woman in the name of Jesus Christ. You leave this woman now in Jesus' name. And those demon forces left this woman right now. They left her immediately right now, just like he told them to. And suddenly she stopped bobbing her head all around. She opened her eyes and a sense of intelligence came into her eyes and she was well. So he was immediately taken back to his congregation where he was in, in prayer, kneeling in prayer on the, on the pulpit. Well, they got a letter then a few weeks after that and said, cousin so-and-so uh, got well on such and such a day. Nobody can explain why or how she got well because after seven years of being totally insane, she was now instantaneously made well. They let her go and now she has a normal life. 
That's what Jesus did for that cousin because of prayer. Uh, so many other things happen. I can remember him telling about a woman that was blind. She'd been blind for nine years. She had six children. And one day, her husband, John G. Lake, called him a brute, I think, because the husband left the woman blind with six children and no way of providing for these children. They'd just have to sit there and starve to death. Yeah, I agree. It would be a brute of a man that would do that to anybody. So the woman gets on the porch, and she just sits in a chair, blind woman. She just begins to pray, and her six children are gathered around her. And one of the, old, the oldest child, she says, Mama, remember, Mama can't see. She's blind. She says, Mama, she said, I see a man coming down the, down the road. And, and she said, he has, he has blood on his hands, Mama, and he has, he has blood on his feet. And Mama, this man looks like Jesus. Well, it scared the children, so they ran away. They ran around the other side of the building. They were scared. And, and then the oldest one was brave enough to peek around the side of the building, and, and she says, Oh, Mama, the man is coming to you, Mama. He's putting his hands on your eyes, Mama. And about that time, whoosh, the eyes of the blind woman were opened, and she could see. That's the Jesus that we serve. That's the Jesus that we serve. I don't know if that thrills you, but that, that really thrills me. Uh, he also had a woman that came to him one day, and she, she, was, she looked like she was nine months pregnant. In fact, the doctors at that time thought that she was nine months pregnant. But when nine months had passed, she was still, you know, they couldn't see any, feel any heartbeat, and, and she still looked nine months pregnant, and she didn't know what to do, so she came to John G. Lake to his church. Well, he, he, he discerns the situation. He says, ma'am, you're not pregnant. This is a huge tumor in your belly. Well, she goes away crying because she didn't want to have a huge tu tumor, nine month, as big as a nine month baby unborn would be. So she comes back the next day. She says, I have faith to believe for this now. And so she comes back and John G. Lake prays for her that the tumor will go away, of course, in the name of Jesus. Okay, the next day after that, she comes back. The morning she woke up, the tumor was completely gone. It wasn't there. She was like a normal person. And so she came to the church to show him. And she said, see, look, I'm normal now. Jesus had taken away this huge tumor in her belly. He said, well, did you know, did you, how did you, did it, did it turn into fluid or what happened to it? She said, I don't know. It just, it just wasn't there anymore. It had dematerialized, if you will, which shows you that the Holy Ghost that Jesus Christ is obviously over in control of all material things. He made it just disappear overnight. So uh, with these miracles in mind, there's no, mir there's no thing that could be wrong with you that Jesus Christ could not handle today. So just call on him, believe that he will take it away from you, and he will, he promises in Jesus' name. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, I hope that you opened your heart today and let Jesus flow into your heart with his life changing power and his love. If you want more faith building materials, go to our website, which is godsinstrument.com, godsinstrument.com. And above all, remember that Jesus loves you.